Hook in. Do I have a hot mic? No, we're good. Okay. Um, yeah, we're gonna we we are cooking. Um, let me see, June Lin, can we can you possibly give us some helpful hints on problem three in module seven at the beginning of class? Worked with another student and we just couldn't crack it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's take a look. Let's see what that is. So what we're actually doing here, we are today we're wrapping up the trap stuff and then we're jumping on the stack and then uh we've got wow next tuesday we have next tuesday and that's it that's crazy that's crazy it's good crazy it's a really good crazy <sighs> um Okay, let me go see what that one is, June Lin. How about? Because I don't have all these memorized, but let's go take a peek. This is module seven, uh, question three. Let's look. Uh, is it the one? Let me let me throw this over. Um, is it this one here? Uh, consider the following machine language program. Is that is that the right one, Julian? I can blow it up a little more. Um, Oh, about counting all the ones. Which one is that then? Maybe I changed. Did I change the numbers on it? This one's module. So is it a different module? Hang on a second. Sorry, no, module, okay. eight. module 8. Module 8. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Um... Now, if I can find my, if I can rescue my mouse, I'm going to be in business here. Okay, module eight. Let's take a peek. Module eight. <laughs> well, let's take a peek. This is the one, is that, this is the right one, right? This is what we're talking about. Uh, write an assembly language program. So needs to be an assembly language. Let's clarify that. We're not in machine language anymore. And um, it counts the number of ones in the value stored in R0 and, and puts that answer into R1. Um, for example, if R0 contains, you know, just happens to contain this value right there, which has six ones, then after the program executes, the result stored in R1 would be six. All right. So I, I'm going to start with, um, I trust that we don't have any confusion about, um, you know, um, uh, what it's trying, what it's asking for, right? I think we're clear about what it's asking for. Um, let me just hit a, a couple ways of doing this. So understand... Um, uh, so Jake, Jake threw something out. There's, let me talk about a couple of ways of solving this problem. Okay. So there isn't an instruction in the LC three, like how, you know, this is, this is engineering time. This is like, well, what are the tools? What is the problem? And what are the tools that you have available to you? Right. So Jake suggests one approach, which is, well, if I take this number, right, if I just take that number and start by just checking to see if it's negative, right, Jake, you'd, gotta, you'd have to do that one first. You'd have to start by going, well, check, check to see if the number's negative. Because if the number's negative, what do you know? You know that the leftmost bit is a one. So you do know you have a bit there. And what Jake was suggesting is one approach. It's a valid approach. Uh, is that you just take the number and multiply it by two. Okay, how do you multiply a value by two? Well, there's a couple ways of doing it, but the cleanest way is just to add the value to itself. 
right? Multiplying a number by two. Sorry, I'm going chapstick time. Because uh, my lips hurt real bad. Uh, add, the, add the number to itself. That's how you multiply by two. And it turns out, we've talked about, but we've talked about all these things. But it turns out that when you multiply a number by two, a binary number, everything shifts one to the left. Okay. And then what happens? Uh, YouTube stream. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's going. I didn't, uh, I didn't actually drop the link over here. Hang on. Thanks, Walter, for the reminder. Um, I do have it. Boom. All right. Okay, so that's one approach, right? Then what you do there is what you would basically do, um, again, going back to what, what Jake was saying, that you you can set up a loop to do this like eight times, right? You've got to have some way of stopping. So one approach is that you... Um, you keep multiplying the value by two, which causes the bits each time. Everybody, you know, shifts left one. And then you check what, what Jake was saying, check the end bit. Is it a negative number? Okay, move it again. If it is, add one to your counter. If it's not, then you don't add one because that was a zero. And you keep doing it. You can either do it until the number is zero, till the whole number becomes zero. Or you can just do it eight times. Either one of those would work. So that's one way. That's one way to do it. Um, it's not the only way to do it. Another way to do it would be to create eight bit masks that we talked about, right? One would be like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and the other would be like 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. In other words, you set up eight different bit masks where each one of these bit masks has one of the eight bits turned on. Technically, you wouldn't even need to do you know, that, that leftmost bit mask, because you already have checking to see, you know, if the value, you know, if the value of the entire thing is, um, you know, is negative, which will tell you whether the leftmost bit is on. Um, you can also, by the way, if you want to like go until, if you're shifting left and you go until the value is zero, you can also just check the value of the, check the value of the number you know, that you multiplied by two, you're going to write that to a register. That's going to set the control bits. When it's Z, you're done. You do that until the, because if you only had one bit and you like shift, it's like, no, no, one. And then you shifted it out and the remainder was zero. Then the Z bit's going to get set, right? Um, oh, you would need, you would need 16 bit masks. Yes, Julian, thank you. I was thinking 8-bit byte. Um, yeah, you would need 16-bit math. You have to loop 16 times. I was thinking in terms of a byte. So apologies. Right, but that's another approach is to do the bit masks. And then you just, and all you would do there is take the value, the original value, go pull the first bit mask, right? Com and it together. And the only question is, is the overall value zero or not? Okay. If it's zero, right, that, that, that bit mask you created with a bunch of zeros and a single one, that bit mask is going to clear everything else to zero. And the one is going to say, preserve whatever was in the original value at that location. If it was, if it's a zero, then the result's going to be zero. If it's a one, then the result will be non-zero. So you don't care if it's non-zero, you don't care, you know, just how, what the value is, as long as it's non-zero, as that's your question, right? So that's, that's another approach. Um, yeah, that's right, Julian. You, yeah, so you would, you would put the bit masks. Well, there's a couple ways of doing that, because one approach is you actually define a bunch of bit masks, right? Now, how are you going to define a bunch of bit masks? Well, you're going to do it with dot. You're just going to say dot fill. You're just going to do dot fills, which just all a dot fill does is take whatever you give it 
and just put that value into memory. That's right there. That's all it does, right? So, you know, that's how you could, that's how you would create all those. But another approach is to, is to create a bit mask that is simply the value one, which would be all zeros and then a one and actually multiply the bit mask by two, right? Add the bit mask to itself, which will move that one bit. So you can use the same bit mask over and over and over again. You just have to add it to itself every time, every loop. So those are all, you know, those are all possibilities, right? Um, yeah. So does that make sense? These are all, these are all kind of ways of doing that. Uh, so again, you can trash the number itself or you can trash the bit mask or you can trash nothing and just have a bunch of bit masks. Which one is best? There's no answer to that. Uh, what is your goal? It, you know, is it efficiency? Is it elegance? Uh, my goal would be, you know, my goal for you would be that it makes sense to you. You know, whatever is the cleanest thing that makes sense to you is great, you know. So does that make sense? That's how I would approach it. But again, remember, you're, you're very welcome. Um, remember that this is engineering work. I have a goal. I, that's why I'm giving you these kinds of problems. I have a goal. If You understand that the answer to this question isn't just like, one thing. It's not like I've had somebody ask me, what's the, is there an instruction that does this? No, no, there would, there, I don't think there would ever be an instruction, like a single assembly instruction that would perform this operation. It's too many steps. It's too specialized and it's too complex. And there's a bazillion things like it that are too specialized, you know, to have a dedicated instruction just for that. Um, so the question becomes, okay, okay, I've got to count all the ones. And you're like, well, what do I know, right? How would I do it myself? I, how would I do it as a human? I would look at the, the value and I would go, okay, no, no. Every time I saw one, I'd go, add one, okay. Now it's two, the three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, the seven. That's how I would do it as a human. Okay, what's the machine language or you know, the assembly language version of that very same thing? Look at every bit. How can I look at every bit and tell whether that bit is on or off, right? Then you're back to, well, what do I know? I know there's a way of telling if uh, a value is zero. So if there's none, I know how to tell that. I know how to tell if the leftmost, so I know how to tell if there are no bits on, that's, you know, I have the Z bit in the control bits. I know how to tell if the leftmost bit is on, that's the end bit in the control bits that tells me it's a negative number. I know I have this notion of these masks and this ability to and stuff in order to isolate a certain bit, which we talked about. So these are my tools. So I've got, I've got a quest and I have tools. How am I gonna use these tools to solve that quest? That's it. And then you have to noodle through. And even this, when it's done, I'm just curious, this is module eight, because I went ahead and, you know, back whenever, um, I coded it, let me see something. Um, so I did it two ways. This, as an example of the complexity to solve this problem, I did it two different ways, but my own original coded version, um, was, was 15 lines of assembly language, 15. And of those, one was dot orig, one was dot end, one was a fill, I made a single mask, one was a fill, uh, a dot fill. And so 12 mm, assembly instructions. And I'm just trying to see what, um, and that was one instruction shorter than what the, the book 
what the authors of the book did. Is that great or not? I don't know. I don't know. All right. Does that make sense? So, you know, 12 instructions to do that thing. That's a little bit of assembly code. You know, it's a little bit of code. All right. Um, Junlin, I'm sure you're not the only one. So thank you for, uh, for bringing that up. Uh, I'm sure it was helpful to other people. Okay. But you understand that this is the, the regular, that's the thing you have to do on every single one of those, you know, that's the thing. So you, you know, you have to break it down like that. How well, you know, you, if here, and here's the thing again, remember when I said that, that saying, that saying, you know, I don't even know where to start, you know, that that was like really not helpful and really not a great approach, right? Certainly wasn't an engineering approach. Well, I don't know, you know, again, we know how to start. We just don't know how to finish. If I give you any such problem, you know, I could do the same problem only just say, oh, and I only can, I only care about the even bits, you know, like, or I only care about the bits, you know, in location, you know, whatever, uh, you know, whatever. Maybe I only care about the even bits defined as, you know, these bits, and I don't care about the other bits. Well, how would you solve that problem? It would be different. Then this, this is like all the bits, count them up. Um, first of all, when I start to say count them all up, you ought to start thinking about a, a iteration. You ought to start thinking about a loop, right? That's going to set some stuff up. Then you've got to check to see if it's you know going to drop in. If it does, there's stuff you're going to do. Set up for the next one. Jump to the top. You know, check your condition. If you're all done, kick out. If not, drop in. And, and so you you ought to. When I say count all the blah, you ought to be thinking iteration which in Python, we would think of as a for loop. Um, in assembly language, yeah, it's a loop. It's a loop. You can set it up a number of ways. But you know what I mean? That's the skill. You've got to just, that's the thing you've got to try to do with all of these problems. Um, but I think part of the struggle for some people is they look at it, they don't immediately know the whole answer and then you freeze up a little bit. I'm not picking on Jun Lin. Um, you know, I, I think it takes a certain just kind of courage and, and coolness to just drop the question and say, hey, we're working on this. We struggle. That's all great. Um, that's that's a recipe for success. Um, but, I, but I do think that there are some, and I'm not saying that that's what happened, you know, in that situation. But I am saying that there are students I know that look at, this thing don't see the answer immediately and then they then everything kind of sphincters up you know and then uh then they don't know what to do next uh and the the just you've got to just break down the problem how would i solve it myself start with that how would i solve it just me start with that okay all right can i talk about subroutines any other any of this is i think that was helpful um, are there any other things that are kind of bugging everybody that might be of, of communal, you know, value? I have just a really quick question, kind of a PSA thing. So on Canvas, it says everything's due on the 28th. Is that the actual for realsies, for truesies, everything due or die date, or is it um, another date? Yeah, so the way that thing works is all of the homework is due on the 28th. You know, the, you know, the initial stuff and the project's due on the 28th. Um, the exams, however, because we have a final exam period, what do you do during final exams? You take exams. What do we have? Module exams. What's your final? Whichever module exams you feel like taking. One crack each, right? You got one shot at each module exam during finals week. So, and if you want to you know, take a bunch or retake a bunch, whatever, manage your time, knock yourself out. Right. Does that kind of make sense? But, but you do have to have the homework submitted by the end of the semester. Um, and the project that last, you know, that last sort of larger project, I will give partial credit for, you know, partial effort where I can, you know, on the project, you know, 
Um, yeah, Junlin, we take the highest score on the exams. Whatever the highest one was is the one. If you take the exam again and go down, we'll take the previous high one. And then that becomes your indicator that maybe you want to use your time at this point, move on. You know what I mean? If you're going, if you're getting worse, maybe want to just hold and then go to a different one. Um, but that project thing also, you know, needs to be done. Uh, there is a thing and the, and I, I want to just say something as long as we're on this and it's, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't know. I feel like I'm not a big, like policy for the sake of policy kind of guy that comes as a shock to you. Uh, but in the case of there's a policy that says no during finals week, right? Now, the reason is because everyone's got final exams to get ready for. And if you just drop, you know, a 30 hour project on everybody and then say, yeah, go ahead and, you know, sub you know, submit that whenever you want, including into finals week, then it tends in general to create, you know, um, an abnormal load that then causes all the other classes to suffer, you know, so essentially it's front loading the suffering. Um, you know, and again, where there are personal conditions and circumstances, you know, where just stuff has happened, uh, you know, uh, abnormal, you know, things above and beyond, you know, health problems and other kinds of things that are a little bit more unforeseen and aren't just, you know, I just didn't get to it. That's that's not an extenuating circumstance. That's just part of the struggle of being in school and being a professional, you know, because you got to do time management personal discipline, what have you, but where there are conditions and things that, you know, just, just hit me up, just DM me. Okay. And we'll kind of, we'll, we'll tr you know, try to work with you and figure stuff out, but that's individual basis. Okay. Um, but anyway, that particular policy, I, I happen to agree with, uh, and think that, and you know, you just understand, I don't agree with all policies. Um, I just happen to agree with that one. And so I'm going to kind of hold to it. Uh, but again, ping me if you've got certain circumstances, okay? Oh, and partial credit. What that means is whatever you throw over the wall, it has to work, okay? I, I literally have had, pretty rare, because I think this is a bit of, a, of an extreme position for a student to take, to lob, you know, hundreds of lines of assembly instructions that are incorrect and don't even work where literally line after line after line isn't even right. I mean, it's not, nothing works. You know what I mean? And it doesn't assemble and then want like half credit because they, the logic maybe is, you know, no, no, this is not how that works. So when I say partial credit, I don't mean, you know, drop a bushel basket full of poop nickels on me and you're going to get half credit. What it means is, and then I would recommend, again, very strongly recommend when you're working on that project, do the very first thing, like print a message out. Start just, just, just do that. Don't, don't write a bunch of code and then sit down and type all the code, okay? You're just going to be doomed. Do the very first thing. Get that message working, okay? It prints out. Ta-da! You know, now get a character to input and, you know, right? Unit testing, exactly. But you're unit testing as you go. Now, add, now you add, just print a character, you know, get a character, echo the character. Ta-da, choirs of angels. Do now, now loop until they press the enter key going, you know, whatever they type is now showing up and they press enter and you're not doing anything with it. Ta-da, you see what I mean? Just do one next thing and know that it works. Now do the next thing and know that that works. Now do the next thing and know that that works. Okay, build the thing incrementally so that at any given point in time, um, at any given point in time, you have a version that you've saved away that works. You can freeze and then if everything else just breaks to hell after that, you at least have a thing that does something. And if you've got something that does something, I'll give you some credit, okay? And it's also a good opportunity for me to remind you 
that don't you dare, don't you dare go plagiarize on this thing because it's going to just be really, really bad for you and your career in computer science in this department. So just don't take you. If, if you're at that point where you have to do that to get the thing done, it can be done in, you know, six to 10 hours. If, if you, if you've been doing the homework and you know what we're doing by this point, you can pound the thing out this coming Saturday or this coming Sunday, you know, on the weekend, you can finish it start to finish. If you actually know where you're at, if you can't do that, take your lumps. And if you're going to fail the class, if that, if, if that project is what's going to make the difference between you passing or failing the class, give some consideration to just taking the fail and come on back next semester and we'll be happy to see you and happy to help you. But if you really don't get it and then in order to try to get through, you're going to go, you know, borrow something that somebody else did. I promise you it's not going to be worth it. Okay. I've already given you my death speech, so. Okay. Can we talk about subroutines? Given you the, uh, given you the, the, uh, the, the uh, fear of God speech, right? <laughs> yeah, right. No, Matthew, right. Yeah. Hey, but hey, boss, uh, you know, uh, or you're a contractor, right? And they're going to pay you like $5,000 to build a website. And you just drop a bunch of dysfunctional HTML on them and ask for 2,500 bucks. Good luck with that. That's not going to be a very successful business model going forward. Uh, not to mention your reputation. Okay, let's do subroutines. Let's wrap. We're really almost done with this part right here. Um, but subroutines. In, in high-level programming languages, we build little routines, right? And then we, um, we call them. We invoke them. Okay. So, this, you know the idea. You know the idea. If there's stuff that you're going to do, you're writing a larger system, and there's stuff you're going to do every time, make a little function to do it. Then... It's just modular, it's easier to maintain, it's easier to understand, okay? When you do your program, your larger program, you're gonna wanna use functions. The ability to like, oh, I wanna do, you know, they just gave me the, the A and the N, right? I've got A, N, I wanna go to that state. Well, maybe maybe make a call to that, to that function for that state. And then, you know, subroutine as we call them in assembly, right? And, you know, and then just do the thing and then return back. Then you can do like a set up a central control mechanism with individual routines. Okay. Um, but you do need a mechanism to get back. You've got it. And we talked a little bit about this last time. You do have to have a teleport system, some way that when I go there, right, I got to have the ability to get back. Now, first of all, how do I go there? How do I go to a subroutine? And the answer is, I know the name of the subroutine. There's a symbol table that has all the names and the addresses in memory of where the code is that works for that name. I grab that address and I put that address into the program counter. Done. Fetch, decode, execute. Now, where's the next instruction going to be fetched from? That address where the code from the subroutine is. Now you're actually running over here. Okay. That's how I get there by just tricking the program counter. How do I get back? That's the one I showed you in the code last time. I get back because I saved away the incremented program counter before I, you know, before I jumped. Now, and, and how do I actually change the program counter? By calling the jump, okay? Or the JSR or the JSRR routines, okay? Those, those instructions. Um, when I call that inside the machine, it knows to change the program counter. Okay. Um, at the time that I'm doing that, if I do a jump, I just, you know, I'm giving you an address and I'm just saying, go there and you go there, you jump. When I say JSR, and it also happens with the trap instruction. If I say JSR, which is a jump subroutine, um, what actually happens is uh, 
the the instruction itself saves the program counter into register seven. Also trashes register seven. Um, but if I say JSR, the machine will take the the program counter, put it in R7. Then it's going to take whatever the address was you gave it, put that in the program counter. Boom, teleported. And not only that, you teleported, but along with you came all the registers, and one of the registers tells you what your return address is, how to teleport back. Later on when you're done and you say RET, that's a jump through register seven. Boom, I teleport back where I came from. Okay, you have to have a mechanism, right? Because if you just jump into a routine, there's no way to get back, you know? And, and you've got to be able to jump into a routine from anywhere. The routine just sits there. You need to be able to call into it from anywhere. You can't, you can't hard code the return, you know, you know in a routine, okay? That, that would be really, really dumb. Very, very bad. So here's kind of an example, right? Here's what we've been doing, right? Which is like, you know, I do the code. This is just picture that that the code's executing this way, right? I do X, you know, the, the X stuff. Then I do the A stuff. Then I do the Y stuff. And then I do the A stuff again. And notice I'm duplicating the code for A every time, right? So A is redundant. So what I'm going to do is make a routine called A. The, 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 the numbers here will, is, is just order. So I've got a, a routine called A, which when I go to X, I do my X stuff. Then I call A. A does what A does. And then it comes on. It returns, which gets me back to the, to the very end after it, it was called. Then I do the Y stuff. Then I call A again, right? Over here, number three. And then A does its stuff and I return four. Then I do the Z stuff. I call again. That's five. I do the A stuff. I return. So it doesn't, you know, this looks like, I mean, uh, all the graph stuff is, looks a little bit confusing, but, you know, just understand that it, it, it is really what's happening. And also, if A is really small, this, this might feel like a lot of overhead for very little win. Except, what if A isn't small? What if A is like 50 instructions, right? 100 instructions. And, and it gets called 1,000 times, whatever. You know, instead of like, right, 100,000 instructions embedded, I can pull that out and it's only 100. And then there's 1,000 call instructions way smaller, right, size-wise. Um, Derby, what if you want that subroutine to return a value, set it to a register value that's free? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a number of ways to do it, Derby, um, and that's a great way to do it, where you go in, when you make the call, you know that, for example, R4 is going to hold the answer. Remember when we did the trap instruction for input from the keyboard? And we just knew by social contract that the ASCII value of the character you typed on the keyboard was going to be in R0. You know, we just knew that if you call that trap instruction, values are, is going to be in R0. In the same way that subroutines know when you get to them that, that the return address is going to be in R7, social contract. So you just document it, right? When you write your little code, you put some comments. You know, and it's the same way, Derby, that you can take a value coming in, right, input parameters and output parameters. For example, I could give you the value coming in could be in R2 or R6, whatever you felt like. And the value coming back could be in, you know, some other register. Or another approach is the value that you're going to pass in, right, through a register might be... Um, an address of a memory location, right? Then you're going to maybe calculate your thing. But again, how do you know that social contract? That's what this, that's how this little subroutine works. It's in the, it's in the header comment at the top. Subroutine, check subroutine, blah, 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 calculates the blah, blah factor, right? Whatever. And returns that value 
by writing it into the memory location pointed to by the address in register four. It will be in your comments. That's just telling you what the social contract. Could also just put the value back in register four, but the caller might want to, you know, to do that. And now the, what that would mean essentially, the first example would be what we call pass by value. I'm just gonna give you the value and you're gonna give me a value back. The second one I talked about was actually has a name in high level programming, it's called pass by reference. I'm gonna give you an address and the, that's the address where I want you to put the answer. So after you make the call and you hand it the address by putting that address into register or whatever, when that thing is done running, go look in that location, there's the answer. The function itself, the, the routine itself wrote the answer to the location that you told it to. What if you screw that up? It's really a bad thing. <laughs> that would be, that'd be very bad. Uh, this is the thing about low level stuff. You've got all the power in the world like what if you pass a value in like six, right? And then your routine, uh, the subroutine expects an address, but you passed it the value of the actual thing, right? What's it gonna do? It's gonna take that, treat it like an address because that's the social contract it's operating on, go over to that location and start writing crap. And what's it writing in? the trap, the vector table for all the trap instructions. Oops. And it's going to overwrite trap vectors with data. And what, what could happen bad? It's all, it's all madness at that point. Descent into madness. Um, let's see. Uh, Derby just said, would it also work? Oh, I just answered it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. That's exactly right. That, and, and using, and also, Derby, the, the FF00, like, that, that's really a good example, right? Um, kind of like memory mapped I.O. This isn't memory mapped I.O., but that we did this indirection, right, through FE00, FE02, whichever. We had this little local variable, right, that held those values. We went indirect. It would be the same thing you would have to do in the code. But you have to know that it's, that it's indirect, right? You have to know whether you're dealing with a value or a pointer, okay? And interestingly, when you deal with C, when you write code in C, you have to know about this crap, okay? Other stuff you don't need to know. In C, you would have to know to pull it, because C is really not that far removed. Still a high level language. It is probably the single language in which I wrote the most professional code was C. Yeah, I'm going to go with that, actually. And number two was probably Pascal, believe it or not. And number three was probably Assembly. And number four was probably C++. Because I'm old, okay? Because <laughs> I'm old. Because I was in my heyday starting in the 80s. That's why. Um, and then it gets really thin as I get older. You know, it's more of an academic knowledge. And, you know, doing stuff. I've written code in all these things. But, you know. Not the same as working in the industry for five years with one language where you get really good at it. Okay. Great questions, by the way. Um, I talked about the call and return. Um, no Fortran. No, Derby, I never, I never actually wrote Fortran code. Ever. Not one time. I mean, I saw Fortran code. But not, isn't that, isn't that funny? As a, in fact, back in those days when I was an undergrad, there was actually, and this is when I had transferred from Iowa to BYU, there was a, we could take a Fortran class. There was actually a Fortran class offered in the CS department at that point in time. Okay, call return mechanism, um, right? It's just the same thing. Essentially, the call, you know, slash return mechanism. Well, let me, let me put it this way. The return mechanism is identical. In the trap instruction, remember I showed you a, a trap instruction, right? In the trap instruction, when you get done, there's a ret. 
And in the in your subroutine when you're done, what do you put? Ret. So getting back is the same thing. When you call a trap, the system takes your program counter. Sorry, I'm doing the lotion thing again. And I, I realize it's like, like just, I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I just need to keep it all down here so you don't know what I'm doing. Um, but So the returns are the same thing. But the call mechanisms are different, right? When you're doing a jump uh, or a JSR or a JSRR, um, your mechanism for getting there is different than when you're doing a trap instruction, okay? So let's talk about those instructions here. JSR and JSRR. JSR, in, in both cases, you're going to calculate an address. And what is the address that you've calculated? It's the address that you're going to stick in the program counter. That's it. The question is, how am I going to calculate that address? Well, we've got a couple different ways, don't we? You already know a few now. One approach is just base it off the PC offset. You know, do a PC offset. So in this case, I've got 11 bits to roll. Now notice, see the little A right here? That A, I think, is for kind of like addressing mode. If it's one, we go PC offset. If it's zero, we go base register. And notice that the opcode, we talked about this already. Notice the opcode is the same between JSR and JSRR. The only difference is the next bit for JSR, the next bit is on, and we go PC offset. Limitations, your subroutine has to be close by. JSRR, your subroutine can be anywhere. Challenge, you got to get that address into a register. Okay, that's the struggle. Once you've got that, then that's your base register. And other than that, it works exactly the same. That's where your address is going to be that gets shoved into the program counter. Okay. Now, the only, and that's really the end of that. And then the only other thing I just want to say, and this is more notice empty. This is the last slide. This is not on the module exam. For those of you that need a quick power nap, you can just dial out. But it's coming back. When you deal with compiler and stuff, this is coming back. Okay. Um, all this is trying to say is that you can externally link, sorry, you can link external modules. For example, here's the, when I take my source code and I assemble it, right? I get what we call an object module, object code. So there's source code, which is a, like assembly language or C or whatever, right? If it's a high level language, I say that I compile it. If it's assembly language, I assemble it. That's the terminology. And when I take assembly code and I assemble it, when I'm done, I have object code. In the old DOS Windows world, it was a .obj file. Okay. Then I have an object module and I keep my symbol table. I, stick, I, I let the symbol table stick around. Then maybe there's like an object module for a math library that I use that I didn't write. I'm just going to bring it on. And I bring the same symbol table in for that. Then maybe I've got some other assembly crap that I've done, whatever. Could be somebody else's code, could be mine. And the symbol table for that. Then there's this phase called linking. And the tool that does that is called a linker. Just like we have an assembler or a compiler, now we have a linker. What the linker does is creates an executable file. So it takes all the object code from the first, from A, the math library, the other stuff, and then it tacks on some other stuff up here, okay? And that, that's called, like in the old DOS windows, it would be like a .exe file, .exe, right? That's what that is. And this is really critical because the world in which we live on the LC3, where you own the whole machine, you type it all in, and that's what's rolling, that's not hardly ever truly typical. There's more complexity to the system than that. We strip it down to make it conceptually easier for you to just get your head around from the get-go. Um, but you can do this even with the LC3 in the sense that I can, I can assemble some code in like or.orange, you know, 3000 
And then I can do another dot, another bunch of code and go dot orange 4,000. And it'll go into that location. And I can do that over and over and over again. Okay. And Walter, I don't remember if we actually did this yet, but we were going to um, make a modification to the assembler in the, in the LC3 so that we could do uh, multiple dot orange. So if you got a new dot orange, you would just change the number, you know what I mean? And keep going, uh, building where stuff goes, et cetera. Um, I don't remember if we actually did that yet, but we need to. Because um, that ability to do, to just put things and hard code them into certain addresses is a certain way of, of writing code, okay? To hard code values when you have that. In this world, you don't have that hard coded addresses, okay? Because when I take an executable and I give it to the operating system, whether it's Windows or Mac OS X or whatever, Linux, um, DOS, um, I don't know where the operating system is going to put it. So I don't hard code stuff. That's why the symbol table has to keep tagging along. So I know the relative position. I know what the offsets are, but I don't know where you're going to put it. Then the OS goes, I'm going to put you here at this memory location. Now there's actually another one not listed here called the loader that actually puts that into memory because it's got to fix all the addresses. Because right now I only have relative addresses. That makes sense. And I got to go through and fix it all at the time that I'm loading it into memory. And, and I'm going to load it into memory where the operating system tells me to put it. So then I've got to fix everything. But now all that stuff inside that program is hard coded addresses, like hard coded in the binary. Okay. And literally, yes, it is like patching the binary. It's just fixing everything in, in the binary to make it work. Okay. And that, my friends, is the end of trap instructions and subroutines. Um, any lingering questions about that crapola? Because if not, we're going for the stack, which is the last lecture, by the way. And for those of you who thought, Walter, that he's never going to get through all this material. So wrong. Probably with a little time to spare when all the dust settles. Any last crap about... Uh, not crap. Any last, any last questions? Any last intelligent questions about the stuff? By the way, can I just say the little doggo, the little doggo door cam is just making me so happy. I had to share it. the doggo door cam. Um, I don't. Know. I just like him. He makes me happy. Cute puppy. I like looking at dogs, and I like other people's dogs. I don't want a dog. FYI. Okay, ready for stack? Because I know I am. I'm ready. Excellent. I'm also SpongeBob. Okay, because I didn't grow up in the generation of Square SpongeBob. Pants. Yeah, yeah, no, I know who he is. I just, okay. is that a reference? He goes, I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, is I'm that what ready. That's what SpongeBob. That's what I'm referring to. See, I don't have any. Yeah. Right, right. I know who he is, and I know why I steadfastly avoided, like, any exposure. You know what I mean? To said square pantalooned what? sponge human. Um, well, I was a kid when it was going you on. You were all so. kids. There we go. Yeah, exactly. You were kids. I was a parent, and had other things to do with my life. But excellent. Well, the, SpongeBob is pretty annoying. Let's be honest. Let's be honest for anybody. Oh, cute doggos. I do love. I do love dogs. Okay, I do. I just don't want to own one. It's a lot of responsibility and time. Yeah, but they are so. Cute. Yeah, but no, Jun Junlin. That's your actual dog. Super cute. Super cute. 
If I had a dog, it would be a hypoallergenic dog for starters that doesn't shed. Let's just start with that. I was somewhere, and I'm going to get onto the stack here in a second, but I was somewhere, I don't know, a store, and there was this lady walked by, and she had like this black sweatshirt on, comfy, you know, comfy black, relaxing on a Saturday kind of thing, sweatshirt. And the sweatshirt is just like covered in dog hair or cat hair, one of the two, but just covered in animal hair, you know? And I'm just like, I just don't want to live like that. But super cute doggo. Um, yeah. Anyway, awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. That's so that's my ring can't my ring ring. What is it? The ring bell ring door ring doorbell, the ring camera. I think that's what that is. Okay. Enough about doggos. Let's talk about stacks of stuff. The stack turn, turn, coming to a theater near you. Um, all right. Let's talk about stacks. Now this is, um, the stack is a classic data structure. Now you you guys take you go fourteen hundred, right, and then you go fourteen ten, and then what is it twenty four twenty? After that, I think that's the sequence, right? Which all those are in Python. Well, in the middle of all that, you're going to learn about data structures, and data structures essentially are like. They're like idiomatic patterns. They're patterns uh, that we attach names to. So we have these because there's just a value in certain kinds of data structure, of, of certain kinds of ways of organizing the bytes, right? And remember social contract. Um, if I say that, that I have a stack, the social contract dictates that that means a certain thing. Okay, you can't say it's a stack and then have it not behave like a stack. You can't say it. There's another one called a queue. You can't say it's a queue and have it not behave like a queue. There are other data structures. There's a heap. There's linked lists. You know, there are strings, which we've talked a little bit about. Um, you know what I mean? Even down to the level of there are integers and signed integers and unsigned integers, etc. These are all just data types. They're just a terminology, a word we give so that when I say stack, you know what it means. And, and this is, you know, never going away in your career. Okay. Stacks not going away. Q's, which are spelled Q U E U E. I don't think I talked about it's a Q is the weirdest word anyway. Right. You've got basically a word that goes, it's spelled Q-U-E-U-E, Q-U-E-U-E. So it's nothing, it's basically the letter Q pronounced Q followed by four silent vowels. It's the dumbest word, I think, in English. But um, I will say this, um, in, in America, we say that we get in line, right? And in Britain, they don't get in line. They queue up. They get in the queue. So the queue is really just a line. You get in line, first come, first serve. The last one in is the last one out. Okay? In contrast, the stack basically goes, you know, you got to think of whoever's pinned at the bottom isn't going anywhere. Next one hits. Next one hits. Next one hits. The last one you pushed off, is the first one you're pulling off that exposes the next one which you can pull off but this bottom of the pig pile you know isn't not going anywhere until everything's you know piled off and that's a stack okay we sometimes call it a lifo i don't usually see that there's also with cues we'll sometimes refer to a fifo which is quite common. I don't know why Q, in my experience, FIFO for Qs is common and LIFOs for stack is not common, but we still know what we mean. The, what we call it when we, when, we, when we put an item on the stack, we call that a push. 
And when we pull an item off the top of a stack, we call that a pop. And then you're like, well, but what if you want to pull something out from the middle of the stack? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's not a stack. Okay, that's just not a stack anymore. I mean, you're welcome to build. You're welcome to build a structure that does that. You know what I mean? There, there are stacks that implement the ability to peak. Like I want to peak four items below the top and just see what it is. But, it, but when I, when I, when I do my little inquiry and I see what it is, I don't pop anything off the stack. Stack stays. I just learn about some information. I can inspect it, but I can't remove stuff by getting them out of the middle and everything has to compress or whatever. Okay. Um, very simply, what is overflow on a stack? When you just run out of the space you've allocated to push stuff on the stack. What's underflow? Stack is empty and you try to pop. Pretty simple. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so here's some stacks. I'll tell you why I don't like these. What do you think? Why don't I like these? What is your, what is your sense? Uh, is it because they're all the same? All the things in the stack? Oh, interesting. No, but in fact, most stacks in computer science, everything in the stack is the same. Same type you know what i mean like they would have to all be integers or all be strings or all be pointers or all be you know they could be different strings pointers with different values you know etc but they would no that's actually that's actually uh consistent with what we'd expect in cs but that's a really good guess that's a really good uh really good guess what, what do you what else what do you think i don't know the stack of the mail is really not like neat and it's bugging me no right right exactly we all all of us that have that that wee bit of ocd thingy going you really need to straighten your stack of freaking oh, mail for sure. yeah yeah and no i'm there i leaning and the pancakes will no oh man yeah and let's not get started on the, the you know the ones right and i'm and i'm one of those right the little ocd the ocd pictures that when you see the picture, you're just like, uh, my soul cannot rest now. I have to purge these pictures from my mind or go wherever that was taken and fix whatever the thing is, right? You know the ones. Yeah. So again, I'm I'm one of those. Okay. For those of you that for those of you that like you people are weird, yes, we are. Thank you very much. Totally weird. We're totally weird. We're we're comfortable with that. Really, most of us are like, nah, that's my it. thing. It's my thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, anyway, um, back when, remember when change used to be a thing, like, like coins, remember when coins used to be a thing? Uh, maybe you don't, what? but that was, yeah, a yeah. Thing? that was a thing. And I, but I remember when I used to carry coins in my pocket, I would sometimes just put my hand in my pocket, right. And fidget with your fiddle with your coins. And then in my pocket while fiddling with the coins, I would like order them from largest to smallest. Right. Usually. Quarters, oh, that sounds like something I would do. Right. Yeah. With the hand <laughs> in the pocket, nobody can see it. But then at some point I had to pull it out of my of my pocket because I knew in my heart of hearts that all the coins, like all the quarters were probably mixed in terms of whether they were heads up or tails up. You know what I mean? So I'd have to like pull it out to get that part right. Then I'd put it back in. But of course, it's going to get mixed later in the day and I'll have to do it again. Um, these are true story, <laughs> stories from the edge. Okay. Starring Dr. K. But anyway, yes, again, if you are these people, you are my people. Okay. No, don't do it. Do not start with those videos and, uh, and or memes. Okay. What else? What else? Can I, I'll, should I anybody else want to guess or should I just tell you? I'm with Derby on this. What Derby say? Oh, you could still pull. Yes. No, that's exactly right. I didn't even see that one. Um, that 
That's because we were focused on OCD stuff. And we were exactly. That's right. I got distracted. And I now see the Rhett and Link, which I now have to go watch as soon as we're out. Um, no, the, the truth is, uh, you know, we've all done the thing where, I don't know, you go to get a plate and the one at the top has is the one with the chip, which you can't bring yourself to throw away for reasons that make no sense at all. But then you like do the lift and pull the one out or you go to put stuff away and it you know, when you're putting this, when you're putting the plates away, they're coming with like three, four, whatever your are, you know, hand capacity is or the side, you know what I mean? They're going in. So it's not uncommon to pull the plates from the top or the mail. But again, you often flip through the mail and with the pancakes, I'm sorry, that's absurd. Um, but if I take a normal little stack of pancakes, uh, what I'm always going to do is eat them in a vertical slice you know what i mean i don't i don't pull each pancake and eat you know what i mean i don't eat it down horizontally i go vertically so but but these are situations where we use the word stack stack of dishes a stack of mail right stack of letters a stack of pancakes right so from that perspective not bad okay but so we got to get more precise about the definition, okay? Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, pancakes versus waffles. But waffles can't be stacked. So waffles are not germane to this lecture. Waffles can be stacked, Dr. K. Have you never stacked a waffle? Because you can totally do that. Okay, confession time. Eddie. I have never stacked waffles ever in my life. And they do have syrup pockets for the win. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. We're so, we're so off topic at this point. Um, oh, my gosh. We're never going to finish. Let's keep going. Stack. Okay. That's a cool picture, Derby. Stacking That's great. I love it. It's got waffles. cups coming out the top. Oh, my gosh. And I'm with Walter on. Thank you, Walter. I'm on that. National I am Waffle so Day. down with that. We should do yeah. it. Just we should also now. talk about Georgia and how many Waffle Houses we actually need in that state. But let me talk about instead the stack, the data structure of a stack. Okay, do you see this right here? I did not take this picture. I just went scrounging for a picture of shopping carts because shopping carts get used okay you're all out of control now especially walter who clearly needs a waffle or two um you gone to the grocery store i know you have and there you find shopping carts right and there are shopping carts usually in one of two configurations one is a stack and the other is a queue so let's talk about in fact do i have yeah you ever gone to, uh, okay, where's a, where's a, um, I hate, by the way, I hate the stack for shopping carts. Let's talk about the queue for a second with shopping carts. Where can you think of um, where the shopping carts get pulled, you know, put in on sort of one end by the, you know, the hired help, whoever the folks are that are grabbing the shopping carts, you know, out of the, the return spaces. And by the way, if you're one of the people that leaves your shopping cart in the stall, right? So somebody can't park there or they got to clean up after you. Really? Really? You just got done spending, you know, half an hour putting on about two miles, just walking through the store. And now, oh, Julian Smith. And now you look at the distance over to the spot where you return them 50 feet away and you're just like, Nah, screw those people. They can clean up my mess. You know, it makes no sense, okay? This is this is what Dr. K says. Do with it what you will. But when they bring that thing back, when it's a queue, okay, it comes in one side, and then you pull them out the other side, right? You know what I'm talking about. And the cool value of that is cart comes in, it works its way toward the front, and the carts get uniformly utilized. Eh? Instead of this, and I don't even know where me where Migros is. I 
think it might be Switzerland. I'm not 100% sure. Last cart in is the first cart out. So during given stretches of time, the carts are going to be non-uniformly utilized. And that is my part of my theory for why it is that in every single damn shopping cart in the world, there's one wheel that goes brrr, when you're just trying to just move down the dang aisle, you know, and in the worst case, it goes brrr, and pulls you at the same time. So you wind up with this weird calisthenic, you know, this, this isometric exercise of just trying to hold the cart, you know, with some cross force, you know, what is wrong with that? My other theory is that that happens when they're getting the carts out of everywhere and they're putting, you know what I mean? I, I, those guys are beating the crap out of those carts out there. That's my other theory. Anyway, but you see the difference? That's a stack. That's a stack of grocery carts. And really, truly, you can't say, I want, I want that one, you know, at the bat, at the far end over by the concrete, you know, you, you can't do that. You literally would have to pop everyone off, you know, move each one back to expose that one to be able to grab it. Yeah. Okay. And I'm glad the waffle discussion got everybody rolling, you know, at some point, everyone's got to wake up. Um, let's see. So I got, I got Migros at, and Switzerland, correct. Amazing. I don't know how I pulled that out of somewhere. Waffle pans are a problem. Okay. What else? Okay. Yeah. Walmart uses a queue. I think Costco uses a queue. Not sure. All right. Now, I'm glad to see you showing a little passion about something in this class. And if it's waffles, I'm not offended. <laughs> I'm not offended or, uh, you know, um, what, threatened by that. Okay. Here we go. This is just an example, right? Here's a little data structure. It's got a little one in it. And we push a two. So that's now the stack. Push a three. Now that's the stack. Push a four. Push a five. Push a six. Now we're popping off the six. We're popping the five. We're popping the four. We're popping three. This ain't rocket science, my friends. This is pretty straightforward. Here's another representation. I do want to say this. We usually represent stacks as growing from a base up. Okay? But you understand that in memory, you could implement... Okay, Emily, no. Stop it. You realize that in memory you could do it any way you wanted. There has to be some address that tells you where the bottom of the stack is. But you could grow the stack this way, right? Which would be, you know, when you think about the fact that we think of memory usually as going from zero down to whatever, FFFF. But you can also conceptualize memory as being zero down here and FFFF up here. You know what I mean? There's nothing magic about which way? Um, same thing with stacks. The implementation could go in either direction, right? I could push things on the stack by taking an address and incrementing from that address or by decrementing from that address. It doesn't matter as long as I keep track of where everything is. Okay? Does that make sense? So here's another example, right? There's my stack. And, and another issue has to do with where's the top? You can look at this again, the, the concept's the same, but you have to consider the implementation. Um, in this case, I push a two. Matthew, that kind of is a stack game called uh, Towers of Hanoi. I can push a two and then in this structure approach, the top pointer 
is pointing to the last item on the stack. But you could also have it point just above that. Again, it doesn't matter, right? If I'm pointing at the last, um, uh, if I point it at the last item, then when I go to pop, I grab the value that I point to and then I decrement my pointer. If I'm pointing above the last item, then I would have to decrement my pointer and then pop the item. The effect is the same. It doesn't matter. There's not one right or one wrong. The idea is really what matters here. Okay. So here's another one. And we're, um, let me double check something. We are, yeah, we're close on time. And yeah, let me just do just two slides here. And then we'll stop. We started just a little bit late. It's really just, yeah, these two right here, okay? In this example, we're, we're now tying this to actual memory addresses in the LC3, okay? Um, what we're doing is we're using R6 as the stack pointer, okay? And then these are just locations. The, these little hash strikes, you know, it looks a lot like the the, the end zone at uh, Notre Dame Stadium. But we're just doing an example where R6 is the stack pointer. And then uh, what do we do? We push. And now, okay, let me see. So, um we push a value after one push, um, right? We put the value 18 right here. R6 has now been decremented, 3FFF. But what did we really do? We moved the stack pointer from there to there. So we moved it kind of conceptually up, but it's in, in memory, it's actually down because the numbering is going that way. And we just keep pushing, push, 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 push. And the top keeps, you know, the number here keeps dropping, but conceptually it's it's going up. And then we start popping, you know, right? So what we're showing here is implementing this. Now, a lot of, you just need to know this, a lot of machine instruction sets, right? Instruction set architectures have push and pop operators as instructions, as machine instructions, okay? Super handy. And there's a bunch of things that operating systems do with that. But this would be an example of how to implement that, what we're seeing down here. Okay. This would be decrement R6. Take whatever's in R0, for example, uh, and put it into or STR. Put it into uh, the location pointed to by R6 with an offset of zero. Right. And then when I'm popping, I load the value of what R6 points at, put it into R0, and I increment R6. So again, in this environment, my stack grows this way by decrementing when I'm pushing. And when I'm popping, I'm actually incrementing because memory is going this way from 0 down to 0, down to uh, FFFF. And when we return... We will be talking about how to do math problems <coughs> using a, a stack and said number of slides is about 10. And then we'll be wrapped up next Tuesday. All right. This homework is the easy homework for module 12 is the easiest homework, I think, in the entire class. So. All right, that's all I got. Thanks, Dr. K. Sorry yeah. about, uh, you know, getting everybody sidetracked on waffles. No, Eddie, Although they the are superior to pancakes. It appears to me, Eddie, that the sidetracking was very eager. And so I'm not going to take a lot of blame for that. You know what I mean? Or put any on you. Because I think everybody was pretty jacked to go. 
Well, it was easy. So everyone, yeah, but it's good to just see the uh, to just see the uh, the, the energy go up. So all right, yeah, because you don't get a lot of that for other kinds of stuff. No, no, we don't. <laughs> so. I'm joking, but. Anyway, no, thank no, you, you're Dr. Not joking. K. You're not joking. It's true. I mean, I am, it's but true. I'm not. No, it's true. And it's okay. Like That's I said. what makes jokes funny is the is truth, the little couched truth in, that's sprinkled in. That's right. They have to be couched in truth in order to be funny. No, I'm not offended. I'm not offended in the least. Okay, I'm shutting down. All right, bye. Yep. See ya. Thanks so much.